Hey everyone, welcome back to the Prosperous Nonprofit. I am really excited to have with me here today, Margaret Chapman Pomponio. Margaret, welcome. Hi, thank you. It's great to be with you. Yes. So we, um, your organization has been working with my company for several years now. So I'm really excited to just dive into more about you as a nonprofit leader, more about your organization. And so why don't we just start with you sharing with us your journey as a nonprofit leader? How did you get to where you are now? So um, I have been with West Virginia Free as executive director for um, 21 years now, which feels wow. really crazy. So I have um, officially entered middle age with the organization. <laughs> and um, so, yeah, I, I was um, freshly back to West Virginia and I had just um, graduated um, from a master's program in political science and public policy. And I had taught a little bit at the college level. And I ended up back in West Virginia, not um, really expecting that. And this organization um, working on reproductive rights and justice, West Virginia Free, um, needed a lobbyist. And um, I had never lobbied before. And, um, but of course, so I have been passionate about social justice issues and reproductive rights in particular, uh, you know, for as long as I've been an adult and a little bit before that as a teenager even. And um, so I jumped right in. And um, that eventually turned into you know being hired to be the ed um later that year and so i was a one person show i wasn't even quite um staff at that point i was a contractor and um and i said if you hire me i'm going to raise money for this organization and i've not looked back um, so we have grown a lot over the years, um, and we've had ebbs and flows and, um, and so, you know, we, we, we work in a very challenging environment in West Virginia, um, on this issue. When I came back here, um, in 2002, it was a very different landscape and, um, we now, you know, are in a state that has an abortion ban. And, um, you know, we started off with some of the most progressive laws on a number of issues. Um, but that has really rapidly changed since 2014. And so um, we find that the work that we do is just more vital than ever. Um, so we're doing a lot of um, birth control access work. Um, helping people navigate what their options might be, a lot of education um, with the public, but also with providers, and um, really trying to like um, build our community footprint and impact and, you know, relationship building. So there's a lot, but that's, that's a little snapshot. <laughs> That's amazing. So, um, yeah, so you've been, you've been with West Virginia free since really the beginning of your nonprofit career. That's, um, that's incredible. Did you ever consider along the way of like making a switch of making a pivot in the work that you do, or has it always been like, you know, your driving force, like, this is what I am here to do. Or have you, you know, had diversions where you're like, okay, I got to do something new. <laughs> well, so I, um, prior, prior to West Virginia Free, I mentioned that I was teaching a little bit as adjunct in higher ed, um, but I also had done two terms of AmeriCorps, um, mm -hmm. one term in Colorado and one in um, Bellingham, Washington, where I went to grad school. And um, so I, my heart has always been with social justice um, causes. I did think for a time that I wanted to, um, you know, stay in academia, be a professor, help engender the kind of passion that some of my most influential professors, um, you know, the effect that they had on me, um, and really connecting that social change piece with higher ed and like building community outside of ivory tower and all that good stuff. Um, but yeah, that got, um, 
I, I did. So I had a significant change when I decided to not pursue a PhD and just do the work. And mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, I, I did actually. So after I um, first lobbied for West Virginia Free, I did grant writing for the state's like biggest hospital at the time, Charleston Area Medical Center. Um, and I had a great boss and a great team that I worked with, um, but I couldn't, I didn't find it as fulfilling as I, as I needed, you know, I, I'm, I've got to feel passionate about what I'm doing. And so that's where I just decided to make the move, um, to West Virginia free. And, um, yeah, I haven't looked back. Yeah. That's um, amazing. Especially going from like lobbyist to now you're the executive director. You're going to lead all the things. Um, in that journey, was there a time when you felt super outside of your comfort zone? And what, oh, did, what yeah. did that look like? <laughs> I mean, Stephanie, speaking to like a financial person, I will say when I first, um, you know, was, was tasked with putting a budget together for the organization. I mean, when we started the, our budget, we had $40,000, you know, it was very small. And, um, and yet still I hadn't done that as a young activist. I mean, I would put together like proposals for funding and such, but literally I would call my mom for help when I was doing financial work for West Virginia free, just to like double check <laughs> my work, make sure I was, you know, doing the stuff right. Um, and so, yeah, that, that has definitely been a piece that is, um, I mean, it's still not my strong suit and that's why we have people, this is, mm -hmm. <laughs> Stephanie didn't pay me to say this, but this is why <laughs> we have, um, 100 degrees because, you know, it gives me like a lot of confidence and comfort that we're on the, you know, the stable, um, path. And um, I do want to get into that a little bit, um, but I'm sure we will. But yeah, so I mean, whatever, I guess uh, as a leader, you know, we have to recognize what our weaknesses are or how we can improve. And my approach to that is like, yes, recognize it, say it and ask for help. I mean, I've always mm -hmm. been that person. You've got to ask for help. And I mean, yes, there is some privilege that can come along with that. And you can, you know, if you're more well-connected, getting help is easier. But if you don't mm -hmm. ask, then, you know, you're stuck. And there's there's mm -hmm. no, um, you know, there's not as much capacity for growth and potential. Mm -hmm. Mm hmm. Yeah, that's so, so true. I, that's and out of my comfort zone, I, honestly, lobbying is um, I mean, it's still tough. Um, and um, even as much like public speaking, whether it's at a rally or at an event or, you know, on a podcast, you know, I still get like butterflies in my mm -hmm. tummy, um, which mm -hmm. I think is also like normal. And I try to tell people that because people will say, oh, how do you do public speaking? And it's so scary. I could never do that. Mm -hmm. Well, you just have to make yourself do it and you have to get out of your comfort mm -hmm. zone, right? Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Oh, yeah. All of that is is so true. And, you know, the part about asking for help, first of all, I love that you were like, Mom, can you check my numbers here? Like, yeah. that's amazing. So like, know where you have resources, even if it is mom. Um, yeah. But I I'm very much like, a you know, driven person, and I will just like muscle through anything like, all right, I can figure this out, I can do it. But like, it is such a like, sweet relief when I finally do say, you know what? I'm not the best person to do this. And then you find somebody that can do it like so much faster, so much easier and like 1 million times better than you. And it's like, oh, why didn't I do this sooner? Why yeah. didn't I ask for help sooner? So it's like, yeah, I'm, I'm still learning that in, in many ways. <laughs> it's, it's a constant work in progress. Absolutely. Absolutely. So I would love for you to tell us a little bit more about West Virginia Free. You, you know, you talked a little bit about what you do, but tell us, um, tell us a little bit more about your mission, your programs, and maybe things that you're doing a little differently than you see other organizations doing. 
So um, yeah, we are a reproductive health rights and justice education and advocacy nonprofit. We were founded in 1989. And um, so we have different work areas. Um, we do a lot of public education on reproductive health and economic justice issues. Um, we're supporters of racial justice. We really, um, our mission is expansive in that um, in order to have reproductive autonomy, true reproductive autonomy, you know, we have to work at leveling the playing field um, for all people so that, you know, a right without access to care really isn't anything, right? So, um, so we do a lot of education on a number of issues and trying to connect those dots. Um, and we also do a lot of um, trainings for healthcare providers and direct service providers. Um, one of our training programs is Love Your Birth Control. And that's actually a really innovative approach. We, we um, as an organization, were one of the first in the country to really start marketing um, our trainings for providers um, of birth control so that they are um, working with a patient and letting the patient lead a discussion about birth control so that they arrive at the method that is best for them rather than the more traditional approach where, you know, a doctor or a nurse may say, oh, you don't want to be pregnant. Here's the birth control pill we think you should have. When there's so many different options out there, um, it's much more, you're much more likely to like the birth control if you've chosen it, which means more, you know, effectiveness and less unintended pregnancy and everything that goes along with that. Um, so that's a, a great program we're really excited about. I hope people will check that out. It's, um, it's a beautiful um, website. We have also one of the best, um, well, we do have actually the best directory in the state of, um, and I would guess maybe in the country of, you know, going to that website, you can find where you can access birth control by typing in your zip code. It's an interactive map that we've had um, some excellent interns and staffers and volunteers and partner organizations working um, on that with us. And then we also have a training program um, where we basically train, again, healthcare providers, direct service providers, and the public on um, how to make a referral or help get someone the care that they need if they have unintended pregnancy. So whether that's choosing to parent, choosing to birth and give the baby up for adoption or terminating the pregnancy. Um, and really being able to give that information without bias um, because we all have our own personal biases um, on you know decisions around fertility. Um, but to be compassionate and to care about someone, to help them be in control of their own like reproductive destiny, we just need to provide information and trust that they have, um, you know, the ability to make the decision that's right for them. So that's another one of our training programs. Um, and then we are doing actually um, self-managed abortion trainings now. Um, in states with bans, um, you'll find these more and more. Uh, we know that, um, and I don't want to get too political here, but, um, we know that banning abortion would never stop abortion. And so we just want people to, um, be able to manage safely and they are doing that at home with pills. And so we're not giving medical or legal advice. We are just simply saying, this is what is available to you. And, and this is how you can do this safely. Um, and then we do a lot of policy advocacy. We've been able um, to get, we've been at the forefront of getting a lot of really good um, legislation passed and helping at the administrative like state level and agencies um, getting good policy passed to um, you know, improve the reproductive health of West Virginians from um, the Pregnant Workers Fairness Act, um, which just passed federally, but West Virginia was one of the first states to pass a state law 
um, like that, birth control um, legislation and um, so much more. So we, we, we love the policy work, um, but it is now, it's a challenging um, landscape to be doing that. Session starts tomorrow in West Virginia. So I'll be spending a lot of time at the Capitol. Um, so that's, that's a bit of a snapshot of some of our key program areas. Yeah. Oh, oh thank you so much for it. Sorry, Stephanie. I didn't say voter yeah. engagement. That's a big one, but go ahead. Oh, okay. Oh my gosh. Yeah. That's a pretty, um, a broad scope of work. How many, how many employees do you have? So four. And gotcha. yeah, so I, I had mentioned at the outset that there's been an ebb and flow, um, and you know, what I've learned over the years is nonprofits have like a lifespan where sometimes you will expand and then, you know, contract. Mm -hmm. We, our budget contracted. Um, we have seen, um, some divestment from, um, national grant funding partners in West Virginia. And it's hard when you're, you know, you're in a state where, um, where we do have a ban, for example, and I would love to talk about the scarcity models at some point, um, but um, uh, so yeah, we don't see as many philanthropic dollars coming into West Virginia as we used to. So we are doing more like individual donor cultivation and outreach. And so that's actually been really gratifying to have more support. You know, we just, we know there's a lot of untapped potential and um, it it has made us kind of pushed us to that realization that we really do need to build more support right here in our own state. And and it's bearing fruit, really. We've got, mm -hmm. you know, we've got more individual um, donations now than we ever have. Um, and was that so yeah, pivot? Our, we were nine staff. And so now we're four, but but that doesn't okay. count. And, and this is something I think that's interesting. Um, you know, sometimes when I'm explaining our staffing, I will include the the people power that 100 degrees brings to the table too. And you're not staff, obviously, your contract, but you contribute to the work in meaningful ways. And we had, you know, that was a real shift um, to, uh, you know, go with 100 degrees and enable you all to take on some of the roles that staff would traditionally um, have done. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, uh, I mean, I, I love that you said that because it does allow organizations to do so much more with when funds are limited because it is, you know, it's only contract, but there's still a lot of power in the work right. that contractors can do, whether it's finance like us or whether it's something else. Um, so that's interesting. I want to talk more about the pivot that you talked about from, you know, relying more on larger institutional funders and shifting to individuals. And now, like you said, you have the most individual um, donations, donors than you've ever had before. Was that sort of like one day it was like, oh, we're not going to get renewals of all of this funding? Or did it sort of, did that shift sort of gradually happen over time where things kind of dropped off and you're like, okay, I'm seeing into the future. We need to focus our, you know, focus our, our, our revenue, our fundraising strategies elsewhere. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, there's a little bit of both. We knew for a long time that we needed to really build the individual donor base um, and so we, we had a program, um, I mean, basically we still do, but, um, called champions for change. And that's where we would train board members on how to make a successful solicitation, no cold calls, but who is, is in our, you know, donor database that, um, we can meet with, build the relationship more and ask them to give more. Um, and it was a successful program, but only as much as you put the energy into and actually make it happen. And so the grant funding, you know, to some degree, like enabled us to not focus as much on on that kind of fundraising. Um, and then seeing that there was this shift away from, um, you know, reproductive rights funders investing in West Virginia from national foundations, um, 
we're like, okay, we know what we have to do. We know that we have all this untapped potential. And so we've just, you know, made it a priority. Mm-hmm. And it is gratifying. Yeah. I think that, you know, I, I would always try to tell board members who were like, oh, you know, wringing their hands about uh, about do, making the calls or whatever. Um, people actually love to hear from the board and from people in leadership at organizations. Um, you know, they feel seen and nobody, nobody, I have never solicited someone <laughs> who is offended by mm-hmm. say, asking them to give more than they can afford. They're like, you know, mm-hmm. I mean, <laughs> oh, so she thinks that I make more money than I do or whatever. <laughs> like, that's not offensive. Right. Right. Um, no. So, so yeah, it, it, it just takes time. And I think it, um, we're still working on getting it more like systematized within our everyday mm-hmm. operations so that it doesn't get like put to the side. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah. Cause so much of that is like, it is really relationship building and it's consistency. So right. it's not something that you can just like binge do like, okay, we need your own donations. Let's like go all in, in November and like hope that that's going to really move the needle. And this is like consistent all year round, every week, every month type activities that you have to really build into your routine. So, um, are there any like interesting or sort of unique ways that you're, that you're doing that, that you're working to, uh, to build that into your routine? Um, well, it's still a work in progress. We do, we actually, um, contracted with a fundraiser to help. Um, Mm. so that, I mean, even just saying that, because uh, I will tell you, here's what I have struggled with sometimes when I am really busy, this is what I will, I will put that on the back burner. You Mm -hmm. know, I'm like, I've got, I've got to work on policy at the Capitol. I've got, you know, I've got all these other fires to put out or whatever. I I don't have time to, you know, do the donor outreach. Well, Mm -hmm. that's kind of an excuse, right? I mean, (laughs) that has got to be one of the key. I mean, in order to do the work, you've got to have money. Um, Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, now it's just a matter of doing a little bit at a time, getting it on my calendar. And even if it means like, you know, so I'll put on my calendar, reach such and such. And I look back over the last couple of weeks and I still haven't met that or, you know, called that person. I keep putting it on my calendar until I get it done. I mean, it sounds really mundane, but that's, that's my approach. Yeah, exactly. You like annoy yourself with the constant calendar <laughs> yeah. reminders enough to actually do it. It's like, oh, I just, I don't want to see this stupid thing anymore. Let me just go right. do it. Right. And then it's yes. so gratifying to be able to like, just, you know, delete it or, check it. <laughs> yes. Yes, yeah. exactly. Exactly. Oh, I love that. Um, you mentioned a couple of minutes ago, the sort of like scarcity mindset when we were talking about revenue in the sector. And I would love to, you were like, let's talk a little bit more about that in a minute. So I'd love to hear, um, I don't know if you remember what you were going to say or your thoughts on that, but I'd love to hear a little bit more about that. Yeah. I mean, I think there's so much work that needs to be done and philanthropy. Um, And I think people in philanthropy know that. I mean, they're talking about it. I mean, I've been on some national um, boards of foundations and and in some of those rooms where people do know, but it's a lot to change. And, um, you know, some of the things, I I guess I'll talk about some of the things that I have seen changing in philanthropy um, that I think are good. So the... um, there's been a shift in the process for applying for grants in, in the social justice sphere, at least. Um, So that's what I'm talking about. And I'm really talking about repro and social justice, but um, you know, so that it's not so heavily laden with metrics um, and the reporting um, with some of the foundations has gotten much less burdensome um, some foundations are enabling grantees to just have a check-in over the phone and, you know, talk about the progress. Um, so there's a lot more flexibility. And I think that's because they realize how much time they have been putting, you know, h- how much um, obligation they were putting on grantees, which was actually taken away from people's ability to get the work done 
that they want to fund. Um, and so that's been a great, but a, a little bit slow moving sea change. So maybe it's not a sea change, but anyway, it's a good development. They're moving in the right direction. It's really exciting. Um, but I think one of the frustrating things for me, like when I think about scarcity, uh, that model, I also think about like what that means for like air, geographic areas like West Virginia that are kind of uh, written off the map. Um, you know, central Appalachia has, has never been a place of great investment. And um, and I think if you're looking at, you know, really impoverished places and it's hard to see that you're gonna get like instant progress if you invest there, um, you know, th there there's a propensity in the funding world to not do it. And, and, um, and so I was always interested in trying to like put forth the idea that we should be funding some work in some places that is simply out of our values, that we value people there. <laughs> and that, um, you know, you may not get a quick turnaround on passing XYZ bills or, you know, you know, starting up new programs and, and such. Um, and so, yeah, I think that's lacking. And I think there's enough money out there <laughs> to resource this work in every single state. Um, but unfortunately, I think um, in philanthropy, they get in their silos. Like, wouldn't it be great if, if the funders of the world could come together and be like, hey, let's make sure that each place on the map and each issue area is funded. Like, oh, we get together. Oh, we didn't want to forget about West Virginia or Iowa or whatever. Um, so that that would be like my dream if they if they could work together to make sure that um, the resources are there. And I know that there are some efforts to do that, but it's it's um it's a patchwork. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, that's so interesting. And I do see because we work with, you know, we work with a number of different organizations that are in similar sectors. And so we see, you know, the same funders sort of funding this same group of organizations and just every single year funding the same organizations. And that's great because that's, you know, the sustainability and longevity for those organizations. Right. But like you said, that's that foundation really being in that silo. It's like, we're comfortable here. This is what we've always done. This is what we're going to continue to do. And so, yeah, there's, there's benefits to it, but there's also, like you're saying, there's under-resourced areas that are just like forgotten because they're not within some, some funders right. silos. Yeah, that's interesting. It's it is is interesting too because there are so many conversations around this throughout the sector, but it's like how long does it take to actually make meaningful change? Like how long until we're not having these conversations anymore? Um and I would imagine a lot of your work like around policy is that also like quite slow moving? Does it does it ever feel like god, we're having these conversations is anything ever going to happen or do things turn around pretty quickly? I mean, it depends. I, they're, they're, usually, if you want to get a bill passed, it's going to be at, you know, at least two years. I mean, we're working right now on a really simple bill with our partners at Planned Parenthood and the school health nurses just to get period products in schools <laughs> for young people, you know. And I mean, here we are, one of the poorest states in the country, and you have kids going to school without, you know, basic hygiene so that they mm -hmm. can feel confident and go to school. Um, mm -hmm. And so that bill has been introduced for like the last three years. And I, this is the year. I know this is the year we're going to do it because the school health nurses are going to help. Um, but yeah, it does take time. And I mean, that's the thing where, I mean, like, you see these states like West Virginia, we've, we've banned abortion. We're like going back in time. We're not going to stay here. We, we mm -hmm. are going to keep building power, connecting with people, connecting people with their own compassion and changing the landscape. You know, like 
but it will take time. And so mm -hmm. that's what we're having those conversations, um, you know, with our own people right now so that we can feel hopeful and know that there is no such thing as instant gratification in this work. And mm -hmm. if that's what people are hoping for, you're doing the wrong thing. <laughs> it is going mm -hmm. to take time, but, mm -hmm. um, you know, we, so it's, it's a long haul, um, you know, plan. And, yeah. and that's how I'm able to like get up and, you know, do it every day because it is tough, but, mm -hmm. um, you know, when you look at it as a, as, you know, a fight for the long haul, it, it feels a little less daunting. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm just like, wow, I admire you so much because there is something to be said for that instant gratification hit when it's like you do something, you get the results. You're like, okay, all right, here's the motivation. And that doesn't happen. I would imagine very often for you, for West Virginia free. I mean, maybe to some degree in some different areas, but I would imagine that like, especially over the past, you know, what, six years, I imagine it's been like quite a, quite a slog, quite a slog. Um, actually not six years, like eight years. Um, anyway, um, amazing. Okay. So we only have a few minutes left and I have two more things that I want to talk about. So the first thing that I want to talk about is, um, managing your, your finances. And so I loved what you said in the beginning, like you're like finance, not my strong suit. I had my mom and now, you know, now we have hundred degrees, which is awesome. But I would imagine that over the last 20 years of leading this organization, you've become, um, you've become more, more confident, um, in your numbers. And so I just want to hear more about like, how does knowing your numbers and kind of understanding what your financial statements mean, what the story is telling you, how does that empower you? How does that help the impact of West Virginia free grow? Oh, it's it feeling confident in the numbers is everything really. Um, and I mean, doing the multi-year outlook, um, you know, it just it is, it gives me so much peace of mind. Um, and, um, and also like just recently, so we had a conversation about how much do we have in reserves? And um, we had prior, we had like three months operating was our reserves policy, which is frankly, I mean, it's better than a lot of organizations. Yeah. Um, but given the shift in philanthropy and the grant funding, um, changes for us, we started feeling like mm, maybe we should have a little more in reserves. Well, what does that look like? How much should we have? You know, we, we still want to meet the mission and, you know, um, excuse me. And so I spent some time just reaching out to other organizations and other EDs asking, what is your reserve policy? And so I did a little bit of research and it, um, you know, it was really interesting to see some had none, some had a year, um, you know, so we're a little bit all over the map, but um, we've landed at six months. Anyway, it's that kind of sort of methodical approach to finance that I think um, gives the board confidence, gives the staff confidence, certainly helps me sleep easier. Um, but also very importantly, the funders, you know, you don't want to invest in an organization that isn't managing its finances well. And so, um, you know, to be able to tell the financial story to our donors um, is, is um, I think, gives a lot of peace of mind. And, um, and I think also, I don't know if this ties into the question, but um, it has been great with 100 degrees to be, to have like gone pretty much totally digital, um, which I will say in 2020, I mean, I was still like clinging to paper. <laughs> I really was. And, um, and I mean, COVID, that was one of the silver linings, you know, like we've got a little bit less of a carbon footprint now. Um, and 100 degrees really helped with that 
also, and it makes, oh my gosh, it makes the audit so much easier. Um, you know, just having everything at our fingertips right there in the computer um, is great. I mean, it was a little bit of a, a learning curve at first, but now, I mean, it seems crazy when I look back at like, you know, the old invoice cover sheets or whatever that we used to use. Yes. It seems crazy. Um, so, yeah, so that whole approach has also just been, it feels like less cl mental clutter and less mm. physical clutter in the office. I and mean, we've gotten rid mm -hmm. of a lot of paper. <laughs> oh, and, that's and incredible. it feels like our books are are just together and yeah. <laughs> I, I love that sort of visual of the mental clutter because I feel like if you know that your numbers and your financials and everything is solid, like there's that little piece of your brain that's holding on to that and worrying that worrying about worrying about your finances, worrying about how much cash is in the bank account. Like that is a lot of energy that is being spent on that, that then you can divert to other things like raising money, like making major important policy changes, like versus, oh my gosh, can we make payroll next month? And, you know, I feel like every organization at some point in their history goes through those periods where it's like, Oh my goodness, are we gonna make payroll next month? That's you know, sort of walking on walking on pins and needles. But um, but yeah, just to feel really solid and confident about that can really free up so much. Um, you know, both tangible and and intangible. So my very last question for you, um, before we wrap up is what does a prosperous nonprofit look like to you? So I think a prosperous nonprofit, um, really has a uh takes care of staff um and um that means you know pay equity um and some you know good policies for time off and health benefits and um and it also means encouraging the team to take advantage of the benefits and try to find work life balance um and in this line of work, I mean, that is hard because you have people who are passionate and they, you know, sometimes want to work around the clock. Not that I know anyone like that, <laughs> um, but, you know, we, we can encourage each other to take advantage of those days off. Um, and and a, another key element, I think, is, you know, a good relationship with community, meaningful relationships in community and with supporters um you know so mm -hmm. yeah i think those are some of the key um the key elements i mean something i think that it would be great in the nonprofit sector if we kind of embrace the pay equity piece a little more and um one way that we're trying to do that here is um updating our pay scales they're a little bit out of date. Mm -hmm. um, but I think like just having those discussions, like transparent discussions about um, personnel policies and having discussions with other organizations so that we know what's going on with each other and can help each other out. So I think that's another um, key piece of a prosperous nonprofit is connection with other nonprofits and supporting each other in a community rather than, you know, again, like going back to the scarcity model, uh, you know, working together with partner orgs um, to help lift each other up. You know, I could go to another org and talk to their board about the benefits of implementing a sabbatical policy, for example, and I've mm -hmm. done that. And, you know, mm -hmm. sharing policy and ideas with each other in community, I think is also um, key. Mm, yes, I love that. And I feel like there's not enough of that, like community between nonprofit organizations and nonprofit leaders. It's like we just, it's very easy to just do the work, head down in your organization. Like you got enough to worry about in your own organization and really making that intentional time to be in community with other nonprofit leaders and other organizations, I know it's quite challenging. And a lot of the leaders that I talk to don't have that space, don't have that community at all. And it's, you know, especially as the executive director, it's like, who do you have to talk to? Like right. a lot of things you don't, you can't really go to your board for. They're not like peer, you need a peer, yeah. um, peer group. So yeah, I think we that's- We have that actually. Fantastic. So we- um, Amazing. 
I help start it up with some other partner EDs. We have we call it the ED roundtable. It doesn't have a sexy title, but <laughs> we have you know a regular day every month. We just hop on a call and make the agenda when we get on, you know, and it could be like talking about employee benefits or, you know, in COVID, we spend a lot of time talking about COVID protocols, but it's just helping Mm -hmm. each other out and being sounding boards for each other. And so I encourage anybody to do that. Um, Just start with a group. (laughs) Have a call. Does and doesn't have to be fancy. Yeah. That's um, doesn't have to have a fancy name. Um, I love it. Well, Margaret, thank you so much for chatting with me today. It was just great to connect with you and hear about all the work that you're doing at West Virginia Free and just sharing your experiences as a leader. So thank you so much. Um, We'll absolutely link to uh, West Virginia Free's website in the show notes. And um, yeah, just thank you so much for being here. Oh, thank you so much. Love 100 degrees. (laughs) Thanks. All right. Take care. Happy New Year. Thanks. Bye. Bye.